everyone, welcome back to Open. Our last guest is a Salvadoran American author, actor, and spoken word poet. Originally from the cornfields of Iowa, he is the author of the poetry book, Guanaco Binge, and his works have found homes in various publications, including Mixed Mag and Low Fed Media. He's had the honor of performing and leading workshops at the legendary New York and Poets Cafe and has been using his platform to spread awareness about neurodiversity, cultural identity, and the first generation experience. Everyone, please welcome Matthew Marroquin. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. I love everything about what you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just the word neurodiversity. I'm like, okay, <laughs> uh, what are we dealing with here? A brainiac? Put on boom. And that's just for people to <laughs> be a little more curious and want to look up the word neurodiversity. Of and, course. And I'm just very curious how you incorporate that in your work. You'll see it soon, I promise you. But uh, neurodiversity, I mean, it's something that. I feel in Latino culture, especially growing up in Iowa, it just wasn't really talked about. Um, so it's definitely something I wanted to shine more light on, especially as I was learning more of what it is, what my funny brain, as I call it, like mm -hmm. is doing and why it's doing the things it is. And then my outlet has always been like performance, poetry, writing. So incorporating it through there has always been like my means to describe it for those around me. And so what, what, I guess, led you to become more curious about it? Is, is it a learning style? Uh, are you a visual learner? Uh, you know, like, is your processing done visually? Like, what is it about? Because really, we're talking about the dynamics in which it operates, right? Yeah. The brain, mi gente, that's what we're talking about. And so, obviously, as a creative, right, you, that serves as an outlet. But to incorporated into your work means that you're dissecting like the different ways in which it could operate yes um what honestly i started only looking into it because of myself i have adhd and anxiety and i was diagnosed with both of those and who knows what else is in there but um in fifth grade and i thought okay i'm 11 years old and you're making me take this medicine for I don't know what, but now I don't know how to talk anymore. I'm sitting very still, and this is really weird. I don't like how I'm feeling anymore, but my grades were good. So I always thought, okay, this is weird. My parents don't really understand what's happening. They just know that, oh, this medication is the fix. So I thought, okay, there has to be something else, something more to it. And as I got older and started learning more about it and able to understand more about it, that's when I started learning, like, oh, maybe I don't need this. Maybe there's other ways to um, occupy my mind but still learn and still be successful, especially when, like, college was coming up and, like, life in general. I wanted to figure out, is there a way to keep the playing field the same for me right? but still feel like myself? Oh, have control, yeah, right? Because that's what we're really talking about. It's like at some point you were no longer in full control, whether it mm. was that you're, you know, whatever, diagnosed ADHD and not to, you know, discredit that uh, diagnosis. It's just a matter of like, okay, well, perhaps that could mean that I need to hone in a little bit more or I need to find tools to focus a little bit better, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just saying, obviously, you know, everybody listened to your doctors. However, I really appreciate the fact that you took action and took, your, took responsibility for yourself. Yeah, given that most research on it has happened more within this century than it ever has before, a lot has changed. A lot of the medications have changed. A lot of what doctors know about it has changed um, because it's definitely not something that my doctors or my family, like, yeah, I went to a doctor and got to see like a psychologist, but it wasn't a long session. It was maybe like 20 minutes and they're like, okay, here's your prescription, bye. And th that's it, that's, that's all it was at right. that point. That right. was the fix. Right. And 
I don't know. It just it just wasn't me though. It didn't feel right for you. It didn't feel right. It didn't and feel right. And you know what? And on top of that, you're a growing child at, at the time, right? You're saying you were doing this since 11 years old. So that's also playing a role in the way your body's developing too, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, I I mean this this whole segment is not supposed to be about diagnosis. However, I think it's important that our our viewers. Um, understand that art serves in so many other forms, right? And um, and while it could be therapeutic, it's also an outlet to kind of work things out for yourself. Yeah, so I, the funny thing about poetry is I always liked writing. I can't say I was always good at writing, um, but I enjoyed writing and I told my mom in like eighth grade, I wanna be like an author, I wanna be a writer. She's like, that's not a real job. Go find something else. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't even know I was writing poetry right. until sophomore year of college. Or not college. Sophomore year of high school. I went to a college for my sister. She was for first gen. So it was like a first gen day thing. And they hired a poet to, this, to go to this college. Mm -hmm. This college is three and a half hours away, by the way. The nearest poetry event to me back in Iowa was two and a half hours. So I saw the poet perform. I turned around to my mom and was like, that's what I want to do. Speak, write, teach. That's it. That's the dream. And after that, I just started looking more into what poetry is. So most of my learning of what poetry was, was YouTube, was, <laughs> was looking it up on research on my own because there was no poets around right. me. Not that I knew of. Spoken word poetry was such a foreign concept to the cornlands where I lived in. Like, back home, I lived on a chicken farm. It's very different from living in, like, a city now. So right, right. now that I'm here in, you know, so close to New York City, able to do work with the New York and Poets Cafe, able to do work with, you know, um, the Bowery, or going to all these other open mics, these slams, these events, these workshops, it's just eye-opening to see what poetry can actually be on the day-to-day -day basis compared to, for me, back then it was, oh yeah, I had to drive to the Capitol just to hopefully get onto a list for a slam and then drive back home. And in addition to that, let's talk about the culture, right? Because yeah. here, you know, this is the, the melting pot, you know, of, of, of the world, right? And, and um, you have this one piece that um, I watched that was, uh, I, I don't know the title of it, but I know it, the the main topic was alien and- Star Trek without anything cool. <laughs> Star Trek without anything cool. Yeah. And, um, and I was captivated by it because I went on the trip with you of, you know, the alien and how you were being referenced as an alien, right? Yeah, and it's actually, that poem is about oh, my your father, dad. Right? Yeah, yes, my, yes. my father and like how my dad was always Oh yeah, they wouldn't let him work very long because he was an alien. Right. And so I'm like trying to figure out like, do I have any alien parts? Right, right. Am I an alien? Right. And in the end, it's just like, I'm not. Neither is he either that, or he's like not a very good alien. Right. So right. maybe but they just you got were it young, wrong. You were young and yeah. the language was used. And so you became curious into thinking that you had some extraterrestrial like part of you <laughs> yeah even, it's, it's not I even that it, I like it, i understood I the concept but <laughs> when i get to go through it in a poetic sense it really is just like huh maybe there's nothing different between us and the people who live here in the states after all right we are we're just human we're just human and i mean in iowa my, my town of storm lake luckily is the most diverse town in all storm lake, like all of iowa like we had 30 languages in my high school. Wow. But if you go to the nearest town, which is about seven minutes away, you know, good goal, few acres of corn between us and them, it's about 99% white. And that's how it is in every single direction for miles and miles away, for at least an hour radius before you find another town that has any decent population of Latinos or any other culture. So my town felt like a bubble where everyone around me was different. It was a town where the teachers had to tell us to act way better and be best behavior all the time when we took field trips, when we went to competitions, when we went to anything, because anything we do is going to reflect 10 times harder on us than it would on any other school. Mm. So it was just interesting to grow up in such a diverse area, but still small town. 
There's more people probably in four blocks of Brooklyn than there is in my hometown, but <laughs> which is crazy to think about, but I still grew up in a place where people would see me and not know exactly what I was. Um, I would tell them I, my family's from El Salvador and they would think it's a part of Mexico because that's all they knew. And here's the beauty that regardless of the fact that you were in Iowa and you were raised in Iowa, you still speak Spanish as well. Yeah, that's the... That's the cultura. Ya tu sabes. I love it, I love it. And it, thank you for bringing it here. What are you going to be performing for us today? So I'll be performing actually a piece about neurodiversity, ADHD, uh -huh. uh, called Looney Tune Existence. Ah. So you're just going to wait to see that one. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's just All a right. fun poem. It's probably my go-to poem that I go to all the time like oh i had to perform one this is the one i'm gonna do awesome well we're we're happy that you chose to do that here with us and to possibly entice you guys to look into neurodiversity yourselves so don't go or anywhere. poetry or poetry for that <laughs> matter that's right i mean after all it is national poetry month all right you guys don't go anywhere matthew marroquin is going to perform for us when we return Hey everyone, welcome back here now to perform Looney Tune Existence. Let's give it up for Matthew Marroquin. When I was in the fifth grade, the school suggested, well, it recommended, well, it basically asked, well, it told my parents, so actually telling my parents that I should go see someone to figure out why I couldn't focus and why I couldn't sit still and why the birds attracted me more than X and Y and why I'd freak out and cry every time the teachers would yell at me or break rulers on my desk. So they took me to a place where my dad said a long while back that Looney Tunes or something like that went to get better. So off I went and a doctor talked to me without sticking needles into my body and asked me about how I felt. And let me sit on a yoga ball and play with this one toy that expanded and contracted and it had points. And the point of this was, well, I don't really remember, but she said she had to diagnose my ever expanding, contracting brain that was too colorful for me to contain and something about ADHD with the vanilla mix of anxiety and who knows what else is in there too. But she said she wanted to fix and yes, I said fix those two first. So I guess I was Bugs Bunny now, because I had to say, uh, what's up, Doc, at least once a month. But the carrots she fed me, they weren't very good. One was small and blue and neutralized the vanilla twist real quick, and the other was like a chameleon that liked to rest on my tongue and go down the water slide of my throat, taking down with it a ball and chain that weighed me down all day. And now, and now I could sit in classrooms, all quiet and nice, just like they wanted me to. But I don't really remember those times because uh, knock, knock, no one in this rabbit hole. It's all dark now. No wascally wabbit to catch here. My parents, they thought they could fix what was supposedly wrong with me, medication, but they didn't understand what was going on with me. They didn't understand what was going on in my head because to them, mental illness did not exist in English or in Espanol. To them, mental illness did not exist in Latino America. To them, mental illness did not exist in El Salvador. To them, mental illness was just me, which is me not trying hard enough. To them, mental illness was just me, just me not being enough. But you see, I always had a question that went around my head after that reptile settled in the shell of who I once was because I always uh, wondered, pondered, questioned, and curiosity killing me about nine times over because if mental illness does not exist in Latino culture, does that mean? I don't exist? Thank you. Yes. Yes, 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 Matthew Marroquin, everybody. Yeah, you get the snaps. Thank yes, you. I felt that. I felt that deeply. Thank you for bringing it here and sharing it with us. You guys, for more information, you can follow him on Instagram at Matthew Marroquin. Uh, Maroc eh, 
12. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. tricky. That's actually a little bit off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my actual Instagram is Vida underscore Maroquin. Vida as in life underscore my last name. It's about my life. That's what's up. <laughs> Ay, mi gente. Thanks to all our guests. You, Maroquin, Vida Maroquin, <laughs> for coming through to your viewers for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recable cast uh, tonight and uh, throughout the weekend, 24 hours a day. At Bronxnet.tv, I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor, happy National Poetry Month, and happy Earth Month, mi gente. Be love.